everyone and welcome to Coast Talks. Uh, my name is Jason Goldsworthy. I'm the Executive Director for Coast and today's moderator. Before we begin, just want to acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking to you from the territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, today known as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. A little bit about Coast first. Uh, Coast is the Centre for Ocean Applied Sustainable Technologies and we are Pacific Canada's hub for the sustainable blue economy. We exist to help industry find new commercial solutions to key challenges support startups and new ventures commercialize innovation, engage with indigenous leadership for ocean innovation, and attract talent, capital, and partnerships to grow businesses in BC. Today's topic on Coast Talks is regarding prototypes. Uh, in the realm of the blue economy, where sustainability meets marine innovation, prototype manufacturing stands at the forefront of possibilities. From bio-inspired designs to 3D printing and resilient materials, there are often questions about how prototypes can navigate the challenges of harsh marine environments. Today, we'll examine how innovative solutions and responsible practices can converge and shape the, uh, the future of sustainable marine endeavours. We are privileged in BC to have numerous companies that are at the forefront of manufacturing and prototyping, a selection of which have graciously provided us the time to discuss with today. It is encouraged to learn more about the capability and capacity of BC to support blue economy innovators through their pathway to commercialisation by providing world-class manufacturing and prototyping. Today's panellists are here to discuss the bold ideas and discuss the future of manufacturing within the blue economy. We're fortunate to have Ray Braun, the president of Rainhouse Manufacturing, Colin Lacey, market and business development for Tie Crop Trailers, Chris Fletcher, founder GN2 CNC, G2CNC, and Wojtek Klaptich, a co-founder and CEO of Offshore Designs. To start us off today, we're going to have, hear from Ray Braun. Uh, Ray serves as the president and CEO of Rainhouse Manufacturing Canada a leading Victoria-based CNC machining, electronics, and design firm. With over two decades of experience, Ray has built Rainhouse into a thriving company of over 20 employees dedicated to serving SMEs in the blue economy, including global defence contractors and the Royal Canadian Navy. Active in community development, Ray is deeply committed to supporting SMEs in the blue economy. He holds key board roles and contributes to various college engineering initiatives that empower local businesses. And we're lucky again to have Ray here to talk about what Rainhouse has been doing in the world of manufacturing and prototyping. Welcome, Ray. Hey, thanks very much. And uh, first, I want to say uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to be part of this. I think Coast is a great organization, so I thank you and uh, Caitlin for uh, for setting this up. Uh, so here, I'll share my screen. I'm hoping you guys can see that. First slide. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so we're Rainhouse Manufacturing. Um, uh, started this dump. Oh, uh, somehow we can't see the slide, I think. Uh, let me see if I can fix that. Share. Does that happen? Yeah, good. All right. Sorry for that hiccup, guys. Um, this is always fun, the fun part. Uh, so I uh, started uh, Rainhouse Manufacturing in 2001. Uh, we started uh, more as just a prototype uh, shop, and we've we've evolved. Uh, we still do prototypes, but more on the manufacturing side now. Uh, so our um, our main drivers are um, a wide range of industries, really, in defense, marine, advanced manufacturing, medical, aerospace, and forestry. And uh, we have uh, a few pillars in our company: uh, CNC machining, quality assurance. Electronics manufacturing services, hot truck manufacturing. As we go, um, <clears throat> our capabilities a little bit more uh, detailed here with uh, you know the type of equipment we have uh, allows us to make a wide range of products um, from idea to done. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of certifications or control goods, so we can do uh, defense work. Uh, we are ISO uh, certified and we're a boilers uh, pressure vessel uh, manufacturer. Uh, we are a first level supplier to the um, uh, uh, Victoria and Service Support contract, work with all the prime defense contractors, really. Um, so, this is a, a sort of a, a snapshot of what a first level process is. So, very traceable and um, uh, uh, strict sort of guidelines for for production of things like this. Um, this is a, an example of uh, if you look to the right, uh, that big yellow lifting jig is something that we uh, 
we designed and um, worked with uh, professional engineers to certify so we could uh, lift some pretty heavy things off of the, uh, the submarine. Uh, we are <clears throat> recently involved in energy storage. Uh, this is something that happened during the pandemic. We started to pivot away to see uh, what we can do with supply chain resiliency, led us to um, uh, uh, discovering that we have a lot of batteries here and they're in electric vehicles and there's gonna be more and more of them coming out. And uh, we are repurposing those batteries to make energy storage systems. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of snapshots of what that can look like. Uh, we are working with uh, Greg Marshall of Naval Architects right now to put uh, to electrify a yacht. Uh, it's a it's a catamaran actually, uh, and it's going to be a hydrofoil catamaran. A uh, very interesting project. The boat's being built now. We have, batteries are here, and we're just waiting uh, eagerly to install them so that they can uh, get this thing underway. Um, uh, you know, to drive our um, our energy storage uh, side, we were lucky enough to get a grant from the BC Center for Clean Innovation and Clean Energy. Uh, they gave us seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get started in in that field. So uh, it's really helping propel us uh, to go further. Uh, so, you know, uh, just a little bit about me. I started this company in in two thousand one. Uh, I came from the wood products and pulp and paper industry uh, as a millwright, uh, you know, got up through all of um, uh, manufacturing sort of a supervisor and, and a superintendent role, decided to go back to school, get an engineering degree, uh, got that uh, degree. And while I was doing that, I started working with a company called Redland Technologies, we're making gamma ray and x-ray detectors. That's how I started the company. And uh, they were great because we did, you know, the machining, electronics, uh, all kinds of work uh, that, that I'm super proud of because uh, that company was the largest acquisition, tech company acquisition ever on the island. They sold to Canon uh, a few years ago for about 400 uh, million US dollars. So I credit them for, you know, making our company what it is, very versatile. Uh, we do a uh, diversity of things and uh, really excited about what's going to happen uh, with the blue ocean economy and uh, the initiatives that Coast uh, is uh, is leading. So that's it. Thanks, Ray. Um, interesting pathway and interesting uh, uh, development in your, in your career. We'll come back uh, to some of that. So just for everyone, I should have probably introduced that at the start. Um, we will have some time for questions at the end of our four panelists uh, giving a brief discussion. Uh, and I've got some questions that I'll, I'll share as well to get the discussion happening. So if you have any questions for any of our panellists, please put them in the chat uh, section or the, the question and answer section, and I'll come back to them at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the, the four sessions. Thanks, Ray. Thanks. Um, next up, we have Colin Lacey. So Colin has a degree in resource management from the University of Northern British Columbia, though he's applied his learning in fields quite different from forestry um, or forestry or wildlife management. His experience includes working in the agriculture sector in commercial mushroom production and composting. Composting? Yeah, we'll go with composting. As well in the beer production and packing industry. That we need to hear more about. While working in the mushroom industry, he worked on implementing new technologies for farm and compost production, having the first farm in BC to adopt new technology. For the last 10 years, Colin has been working for tie crop trailers, helping customers get the right equipment built for their specific needs, in roles in the supply chain, sales, and now business development. In this time, he has gained insights into process-driven manufacturing and the manufacturing systems needed to convert an idea into a, a sustained production. He has overseen the development of new products used for hauling mining products and wood fibre and the creation of a new production line to build enclosures for mobile power generation equipment. He loves the opportunity to work with customers, helping them bring their ideas to life. Welcome, Colin, and we're looking forward to hearing about tie crop. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come here and uh, talk to everybody today. Uh, and introduce um, a lot of people to tie crop trailers. I know I've, I've spoken at other um, marine uh, events before and the name tie crop trailers really uh, causes people a little bit of pause. So hopefully by the end of it, we'll, uh, you'll see why tie crop trailers uh, fits into uh, the marine space as well. Uh, next slide. 
So tie crop trailers has been in the Fraser Valley since 1978. Um, we initially started by building agricultural equipment. Uh, uh, the owner of the company who's still involved every day, he grew up on a farm and he didn't want anything to do with the actual running of the farm, but he really enjoyed um, fixing and improving the equipment. And that quickly led into building equipment for um, the the farming community here. And it turned into a small shop and that small shop turned into a bigger shop. And then uh, from there, he was asked to undertake other projects. So since 1978, we've gone from building agricultural equipment to building transportation equipment over the road. Um, we built a line of turf management equipment. And now the company is in uh, oil and gas products as well. And right now, the part of the company that I work for, we're looking at expanding our capabilities and, and moving beyond just building um, trailer and uh, uh, tra trailer products and moving into more aluminum, rather, whether it's enclosures or uh, we're working with a, a local boat manufacturer to build some um, kit parts for some of the uh, river boats, aluminum river boats that he's building. Uh, next slide. So just as a, a structure for, and it's not showing all of the slide, unfortunately, but uh, at, it shows basically the breakdown of, of how the company is set up. So at the top, there's uh, uh, tie crop corporate manufacturing. And then underneath of that, there's the division that I work for, tie crop trailers. There's our oil and gas division, Propel. And then there's the uh, other projects that we have on the go. So we're very open to working with other companies. We have uh, other lines of products that we are building, uh, things that had never been built before and that we've run through our facility. Next slide. Ah, there we go. Okay, there's the tie crop trailers and next. There's our oil and gas and next. And those are the other companies that, uh, that we've partnered with. So, Tie Crop Trailers from its very beginning has been more about just building um, products that come off of the line standard. We really look to partner with our customers to build them something that's uh, specifically suited for their for their purposes. So the trailer featured in the picture was um, a project that we worked on with Aero Transportation. It involved the Ministry of Transport. So our engineering team uh, worked with the Ministry of Transportation aero transportation, the mine that they were hauling with, and we were able to create a new product that had never been built before, uh, a unique tipping system that was suited specifically to this project. So never built before, prototyped, and then uh, a number of these products are now uh, successfully up and running and have been for uh, over a decade. Next slide. So today, specifically, uh, uh, innovation in manufacturing, where have we gone? Next slide. So from the beginning, from the uh, first shop that we've opened, we've we've grown our in-house capacity to be able to handle more and more uh, of what it is that we build. So we're capable, we have a, a full in-house engineering team. We have all of the regulation and certification processes in place, and we've expanded our manufacturing uh, capability. So we have plasma tables, laser tables, uh, breaks and presses to make all of our parts. We work in steel, aluminum, stainless steel, uh, and and we've added uh, the capacity to be able to paint and prep pretty much any surface for any parts that we're building. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, I was saying we have a full in-house engineering team, and over time we've moved beyond just uh, structural or mechanical capabilities and added electrical hydraulic systems and now we're moving into a lot of uh, software and control development for the products that we're doing. Next slide. So right now, Tie Crop Trailers, our mission was to focus on building trailers. Our vision for the company, and which is the phase that we're moving into now, is to move beyond just manufacturing trailers and really take the core capabilities that we've had uh, developed over 40 years and apply that into new industries, new fields, and new products. Next slide. And just a couple of quick things. Some of these are some of the uh, aluminum closures that we're working on now, partnering with our oil and gas. 
uh, company. So we're building mobile uh, enclosures for housing electrical components uh, for power generation. Uh, and we're building control cabs as well that have lights and HVAC and heating and all of that. Next slide. Uh, so really coming here today and, and talking to you, the value that we want to bring is saying that we have a capability and a capacity to help you with products that you may need to get out there. Uh, we have developed process-driven manufacturing lines for a number of different products. And hopefully we can bring that to the um, marine uh, industry. Next slide, last slide. Uh, and like I always like to say, we love having people come through the facility so that you can get a sense of who we are as a team, who we are as a company. And really that's where the magic happens is when we can actually figure out what it is that, that we can help you with to either develop your product or improve it or just manufacture it. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. And yeah, on that last slide there, I was lucky enough to to get out to see Thai Crop last week and it's a pretty impressive uh, facility. And, and that's only one of the two facilities you've got. So it's definitely worthwhile if people are in the area, reach out to Colin and, and definitely look at what they've, they've created there. Next up is uh, Chris Fletcher. Uh, Chris is the founder of GN, uh, G2CNC, I did it again, and president of Genesis Marketing Group. In 2021, Chris decided to start G2CNC, I got it right that time, yeah. after exiting a 20-year career in the beverage industry. With a passion for the ocean and sailing, Chris began to develop a, a line of performance sailing hardware, but also had a desire to prototype, manufacture, and package these designs in Campbell River. As a challenge, Chris spent the next two years developing the G2 sailing line, along with a modern boutique lean manufacturing system that brings products from idea to finished in packaging in all under one roof, all in under one roof. As the idea progressed, G2 attracted a number of customers who benefit from this lean product development system, and G2 has been on an exciting path into end-to-end -end advanced manufacturing, um, manufacturing partnerships ever since. Chris is also an accredited marine yacht surveyor, which you do in your spare time, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. So thanks, Chris. I'll, I'll hand it over to you and give a, a running down on what G2CNC does. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jason, and thanks um, to both you and Kaylin for, for putting this Putting this on, uh, it's uh, it's been fun talking to everybody so far. Um, G two C and C is yeah, we started it back in in twenty twenty one, and um, G two is owned by uh, Genesis Marketing Group, and our roots uh, in Genesis Marketing Group are actually in the beverage industry, so we we come from more of a marketing marketing side, um, and uh, we were a uh, trademark holder uh, in the beverage marketing industry and um, produced a fair number of different products uh, across Canada. We had two production facilities um, and and really spent a lot of my career in the fast moving consumers goods uh, industry in the beverage industry and and production and production management in the beverage beverage industry. So um, so large scale production, um, you know, three hundred to five hundred bottles minute production in facilities and shipping you know hundreds hundreds of containers across the country um so quite a large uh, quite a large scale business and quite a complex business and um it was uh, it was quite a challenging business to be in uh with the cost of freight and manufacturing and glass and all kinds of things um so we decided to package that business up and sell that business and move along from that and started g2 cnc um that's located in Campbell River. Um, and I was really excited and really wanted to get into uh, sailing hardware. I'm an avid sailor. So um, so we invested in some, uh, some advanced CNC uh, machining equipment and started developing our line of sailing hardware. And in the meantime, we're really developing also a production system and production management system and a quality management system that went along with our our product development and we were finding that we were, we were attracting quite a few customers who wanted to prototype with us who wanted to design products and and have a quick turnaround and have a good relationship while we we're while they're developing products um and so we we're doing that at the same time as developing our our line of sailing hardware so what we did at g2 is cnc is we have a basically a small it's like a boutique level manufacturing facility um, where we can produce products uh, from end to end. So from 
basically from raw material to a finished product that uh, including including finishing processes like anodizing and powder coating that we uh, we do all in house here and product packaging. So we created this lean manufacturing system and this integrated solution um, that other customers uh, have benefited from as well while they're going through their uh, product early product development phases or their new product launch phases. So it allows them to uh, develop products, do the rapid prototyping, get products, get functional prototypes and products in people's hands and get them packaged and ready for shipping. Um, so we're able to help uh, quite a number of clients do that here in this small facility in Campbell River. Um, and while we're developing our manufacturing system, we're also working our, on our quality system. So we invested a fair bit of, of money on uh, metrology and measuring equipment. So we have some some very advanced measuring equipment here in the tactile measuring side. Um, so we're able to measure um, pro, uh, measure and qualify down down to sub micron level. Um, and then we also have um, capabilities where we're where we're doing tensile testing on site, um, salt spray testing on site. Uh, we do travology testing and bearing testing here for for sliding surfaces, um, and so these are all technologies we developed uh, in our shop to give us more capability and help our customers um, produce products quicker. Um, but yeah, the whole idea, the concept of G two at CSC was to have a full three hundred and sixty production facility in a in a small smaller, uh, 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 more remote area like Campbell River and prove that it, we were capable of, of doing all these manufacturing processes here. So um, so it's been an interesting journey. We've had a lot of fun doing it. Um, we, with, with our, with like with our sailing line, we, we really focus on lean. So when customers, uh, when they order product, the only piece of inventory we carry is a piece of, piece of metal that looks like this. So that's, that's our inventory here. Um, we don't carry finished product here, and those get turned into functional finished uh, finish, uh, blocks and shifts and sailing hardware um, all in our shop here with, with packaging and everything too. So, um, so we do that all in-house. We do that with a lean approach, and we work with our customers with that, uh, that, that same mindset as well too. So, um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We do a lot of prototype work. We do a lot of, uh, small batch production work. We do uh, three, four axis, uh, machining and turning. We do powder coating and anodizing all in house. Um, we do, um, we do heat treating. Um, we do a whole bunch of, whole bunch of processes here in house. Um, again, on a small scale. So we're, we're lean and we're nimble. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, uh, we really love what we do. So uh, our, our customer base is anywhere from uh, aerospace. Uh, we do aerospace to aerospace components to aerospace production management, uh, manufacturing systems. We work with uh, customers in uh, aquaculture. There's uh, obviously quite a large aquaculture industry here in Campbell River. And, um, okay. and we also work with subsea robotics as well um and a whole a whole number of different products that that, that are, are ocean based as well too um and jason said like we also own a uh, marine surveying business here in, in campbell river so we do uh, another business called tech marine surveying that um that does yacht and small craft surveys uh from anywhere from uh small vessels up to uh up to medium-sized commercial vessels so um, so that's up and down the coast as well, too. So, so we're our business and our our roots are really tied into the into the marine ecosystem. So it's fun to be part of this call and um, and conversation, and see, and we're excited to see how we can uh, help some people out too. Thanks, Chris. I, I love the uh, the going from the little plate to the, the whole turning block. I'd never expected that to, to happen. I've always seen the turning blocks, but you know, don't imagine it comes from a little plate. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, sure Incredible. <laughs> I, I, I got to come and see that. I want to. I want to see that <laughs> turn into a turning block. In fact, I might yeah. need a few for my for my boat. So we'll we'll, we'll have that discussion after. Exactly. Thanks, Chris. Um, our last panelist today is Wojtek Klaptuch. Wojtek is a mechanical engineer with expertise in aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, mechanical design, 
experimental testing, and the application of advanced analysis tools for both research and commercial purposes, which makes him perfect for today's discussion. He earned his Bachelor of Applied Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Waterloo in 2002, and went on to complete a, a Master's of Applied Science in Mechanical Engineering with a specialization in naval architecture at the University of British Columbia in, in 2006. Wojtek is the co-founder and CEO of Offshore Designs, and he's going to tell us a little bit about Offshore Designs and, and how it links in with the prototypes and this, uh, discussions today. Thanks, Wojtek. Yeah, thank you, Jason, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, as a quick background, uh, my co-founders and I uh, started Offshore Designs back in 2018, and our goal was to develop technologies that reduce uh, GHG emissions and marine transportation. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, I have a background in mechanical engineering and naval architecture. I've been using that for the past 15 years to develop, uh, you know, technologies um, internally as well as for uh, clients on a consulting basis, primarily in the marine renewable sector and uh, more recently focusing more and more on underwater robotics. And it's often been uh, starting from a uh, clean sheet design and going all the way through to you know, building full scale prototypes and testing them in the field. Um, next slide, please. So, so I just put together a couple of slides and this is the first one on marine renewables and some of the work we did um, to give you an overview on what building prototypes in these spaces look like. Um, you know, so basically when, you know, when you're moving from uh, the lab to the ocean, the prototypes that are built need to be designed to survive the marine environment. Um, so that usually means that you have to scale up to some minimal size that can um, allow these prototypes to take the loads of, uh, you know, storms, high currents, large waves, and winds that they're going to be exposed to while they're, you know, being deployed and tested. Um, it also means that you need to design them so that, uh, it can take the uh, impact from, you know, everything that's out there floating in the ocean, including you know, ocean debris. So, you know, the in these slides, what I'm showing is a is a tidal turbine that we we designed and and built and deployed. Um, so in the top left corner, you can see, you know, at one point in time, the turbine, a big root ball came at it, and uh, luckily, you know, the structure is designed to big enough, uh, strong enough to, to withstand these loads and they got fished out. Um, you know, the image below is a component of uh, the mooring system. And uh, this is a picture of how quickly, you know, to show how quickly biofouling starts to have an impact on uh, structures. And this is a, you know, after two months of deployment, the structure is already starting to become overgrown. And uh, about a year later, it basically looked like a kelp bed. Um, the other thing that's really important is, uh, you know, keeping, uh, uh, you have to design for corrosion, um, as I mentioned, biofouling, so that needs to be considered uh, in the design process. So what we usually do, I guess, uh, for these types of projects is we tend to, you know, use typically, uh, you know, materials that are used uh, and seen on the coast, like marine grade aluminum applied marine coatings, uh, you know, add anodes and steel components to prevent corrosion. And, uh, you know, we've also done some experimenting with uh, composite materials, but we have found uh, it is, is difficult to do at a, at a prototype stage because it often involves a significant investment to say make molds. Um, so we do defer often to just more using you know, aluminum extrusions to make blades, for example. So those, these are some images of, you know, the aluminum hulls we had built and, uh, and, and blades and steel structures we had welded up and, and things like that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. And then on the underwater robotics side, um, over the past few years, we've been working in this space. So more specifically, we've been developing a robot to clean biofouling uh, off of large ocean going vessels. So the idea is to reduce um, the drag on the vessel, which leads to fuel reduction and uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. 
and also safeguards the environment because you don't have over, you know, species attached to the hull going from one port to another posing a threat in terms of, uh, you know, introducing invasive species from um, foreign locations. Um, so similar to the, to building prototypes in marine, marine renewables, uh, material selection is, you know, very important as well. Um, but since we're working at a smaller scale and a more controlled environment in this case, and for shorter periods of time, so deployments, you know, for hours versus, you know, weeks, uh, months, years, um, we can afford to take some shortcuts. So more options become available for building prototypes. So this um, definitely includes 3D printing that allows you to quickly iterate through designs. And what's really a, exciting in this space, um, you know, is how many new components and, and low cost components are starting to come on the market. And I'm seeing this in the last you know, two to three years and something new comes out every six months, something that really makes a difference to us. Um, so it means that building prototypes is becoming uh, easier and easier and, and faster and, and costs less money. Um, because uh, you can basically focus on developing your core tech and integrating many of the uh, components that are starting to become available. So, you know, in the past, many companies would design their own underwater cameras or lights or thrusters, and all these things can be, um, you know, purchased right now. And they're also being uh, manufactured in such a way that uh, they're, you know, very cost effective. So, yeah, these are the, you know, some of the, projects I've worked on discuss um, over the course of this discussion. Thanks, Wojtek. Um, amazing to see how much that fouling of the happens over such a short period. I guess everyone that's working in this environment understands how harsh the uh, the environment can be and and how how quickly it can uh, it can tackle that the environment can tackle the the, the piece of equipment. So Thanks for thanks for that discussion. Um, I'll get everyone now to put their cameras and microphones back on because uh, now is the fun part for me. I get to pose questions uh, of you guys and uh, appreciate um, the little bit of introduction that you gave to each of the companies. Uh, I'd also encourage our um, participants or our, our viewers as well to ask our panelists some questions um, using the Q and A button at you should be at the bottom of the screen. So. Um, thanks again, everyone. Uh, I'm going to go straight to, I'm going to start with Ray. Ray, um, this is a, a new one. It's not one I've prepped you for. So, the, you know, the, I like to do this every now and then. Um, you talked to, uh, just listening to everyone introduce themselves and their backgrounds. Uh, everyone's come from quite different backgrounds into manufacturing, some from engineering, some from other areas. What do you, your background in particular, I mean, how has that helped you be successful in the manufacturing sector? How has your experience and your knowledge from the different, um, your different career path uh, helped you with manufacturing? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was I was uh, a born tinkerer, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, 16, I bought my first car and I was, I was working on it and, and modifying, doing things like that. Uh, that ended up uh, leading me into uh, a career as a, Millwright, so that's an industrial mechanic. So we had to do, you know, a lot of uh, rebuilding of equipment in the pulp mill, and uh, you know that led me to to I was curious because I know how to do all this stuff, but I'm working from tables and not really understanding the fundamentals. So I decided to go get an engineering degree at uh, the University of Victoria, and all those things really built up uh, uh, vision where where and, and things happen right like uh, i was sharing space doing a master's in mechanical engineering at uvic sharing space with people that were growing semiconductor materials and uh, they were really interesting because they were all physicists and scientists uh, they didn't care about mechanical electrical software uh, and they were a vc funded company they didn't have a lot of money uh, so they hired me as their engineering department like did it all and that was an amazing ride, like 15 years of uh, building semiconductor processing equipment, uh, furnaces, all kinds of uh, 
Well, you can imagine what it would look like in a semiconductor production plant, but we basically built all the equipment that they needed to grow, cut, polish, uh, put electronics on their product. And so that, that set me up so that I could have this very interesting company that's, that's used to solving problems for people. So it's a lot, almost like you need to be a master of everything. Not a specialist yeah, in everything. Yeah. Need to know a bit Not about all everything. Trades, but a master of none. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it, it shows that you do that, that need that breadth of knowledge to to be successful in in the, in the sector. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to come across to to Colin now, and and Colin, early on in your presentation, you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, that when people hear the word tie crop trailers, everyone sort of goes, why are we talking in the blue economy context? But um, one of the things that uh, you know, I wanted to demonstrate uh, today was that there is capability out there for the blue economy, for, for manufacturing prototypes and mass, um, mass manufacturing. Can you maybe give a, a bit of a, a intro to, to why like bringing in um, sort of perspectives from other uh, sectors is beneficial for for the marine sector. Um, <clears throat> well, one of the reasons why I was excited about presenting here today is that, uh, like over the years, we we've done a lot of different manufacturing. So, um, if you get stuck in one way of looking at something all the time, maybe you miss out on a little bit of like. It, something that you can learn from how somebody else does it in a different industry. But we really have like over the time we've changed the types of products that we've made so fundamentally. And um, it, it's part of the DNA of who Tycrop is um, going from manufacturing agricultural equipment. And that has a very specific set of requirements. It operates in a different uh, um, realm, the the users are using it in a different way. And then to go to building trailers that are on the road and developing the skill set that you need in order to do all the regulatory stuff, uh, to have trailers uh, hauling uh, product on the road um, and, and building that skill set. So over time, we've really tried to develop and grow and do new things. So for somebody from the marine business to come out and see us, uh, they would get to see a company that's grown and developed over 40 years uh, and, and learned how to do new things in different ways. So just, I, I find it's so beneficial if you can actually sit down and talk with somebody and really pick their brain on how they've done different things. It's, it's that uh, getting input from various sources and it really helps grow your understanding of what it is that like how it is that you may be able to do something like you don't know what you don't know until you've gone out and seen um, different companies doing it in, in, in different ways and, and uh, it might even open up the perspective of, you know, like, there is the capability here in BC to really mass manufacture something. You don't have to think about going offshore to do that. We do have the capability here. Um, really get to see the scope and scale of some of these manufacturing companies in British Columbia and what it is that they can do. Like we we deal with um, building the small parts right from design from the engineering department to our parts making department so that we can control everything in-house and it really helps that prototyping um, ability. We don't have to outsource when we're building a new product either for ourselves or for somebody else when we're doing contract manufacturing. We have bays specifically designed to build products that have never been built before um, and, and fairly large scale, like we're talking footprints in meters by meters, not uh, something you can hold in your hand. These are these are things that are driving on roads on frac sites. These are substantial pieces of equipment. So we've developed the space to be able to do that. And the capabilities, like the team of people that work in the prototyping uh, department, that's a very special skill set of people to have. They can adapt and overcome because sometimes things on paper don't actually fit uh, the way that uh, you would think they do. I mean, the model shows that they all fit, but 
Yeah. When you go to put it all together in real life, sometimes there's some challenges that you didn't think. Uh, and you really get a, a sense, like in that prototyping too, yeah. of how to change buildings one of a thing into how do you put it on a production line? So uh, it's, uh, yeah, we can, the nice thing about being able to come out and see us is you can see a company that has done that. We've struggled, we've built the new products. We've, uh, I'd like to say that we've learned and gotten better over time. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed to hear that things don't always go according to plan. I thought that was, yeah, that was I mean, life, wasn't you it? Know, you know, you, you, can, you can do all the best plans and, and really prototyping is where you can really refine that plan, especially if you plan to build more than one or two of the thing that you're building. That that's that's really where the magic and the the prototyping process comes down. You can really refine that. That's that's where you can turn it into a scalable product. Well, that's a good segue. I was going to um, ask uh, Voitek next about you know Voitek. You've been part of working on the designs of these prototypes and and working and seeing it evolve. What are the important parts of, of of prototyping and how is it different from mass manufacturing in terms of what are the the considerations that people should make when they're when they're developing a prototype specifically to demonstrate their technology? Um, yeah, I think a, a big uh, big consideration for us is always about you know if, if we're gonna build it, we we want to use uh, we want to build it locally if possible. Um, you know, using local machine shops, uh, build things out of, um, yeah, um, say aluminum components in ways that, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's easy to basically manufacture and then uh, modify quickly um, if something doesn't come together, which is kind of, you know, along the same lines as Colin said. Um, so we're always, yeah, we're always looking to that and most of the prototypes we've built. We have done, you know, the majority of the work locally. I think the exception um, would be, you know, something on the electronic side, more like PCB, uh, you know, manufacturing. Uh, the majority of that uh, seems to be just, you know, better done in China at a lower cost. Um, so those are some of the components that we've done externally, but definitely focused in on um, just having things done locally because, yeah, the you know even from the machine shop when you get all these components back, they they may not fit together. You can quickly go back, have it uh, modified, or we've even assembled, you know, worked with one machine shop and assembled components on site, checked fits, or explained to the machinists. So those are you know all the advantages. So until you have it all very well, you know, tuned and all your tolerances right, and you've assembled it. Uh, once and then you realize you know it'd be easier to do it this way or that way once you get through all of that you could start looking to more ma mass manufacturing but uh early on it's uh yeah we've always focused on building locally and and it's and it's fine everything's um you know it, it's we're, we've been able to do that so you know on the machining side lots of machine shops sure but even on the fabrication side when we built some of the bigger components for a tidal power project, you know, we built uh, everything related to, you know, the the mooring um, and anchoring frames that we deployed. So this was a 16 by 16 foot frame um, that weighed four tons, made out of steel. We then dropped another uh, four six ton blocks on top of that, and just moving these components around. You know, it's you want to get it built as close as you can to your project. So in this case, we literally had it built by, um, you know, welders, a, a shop at the uh, Campbell River Marine Terminal. Um, and from there, it was directly loaded uh, onto a vessel and taken to site. So I think a lot of the transportation considerations are also important as you get into these bigger projects. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to change hack a little bit here that's a, that was a sailing euphemism um chris uh, gonna come to have a discussion to you about 
You mentioned that uh, G2CNC does work with aquaculture and uh, on sailboats, obviously. What are some of the tricks for for making sure that the manufacturing deals with the harsh marine environments? So obviously, we've got salt water, we've got pressures, we've got temperature variations. What are some of the key things with, especially in the in the early stages of, of making sure these these parts are actually survive these conditions? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good good and challenging question. Um, it, you know, it 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 all comes down to the uh, to the application, right? Um, so we can have we we produce anything from uh, plastic materials and plastic components that may be above waterline or near waterline. Um, you know, they might they might do quite well in the water, but we also have. Um, you know, some thermal issues to deal with, with expansion, contraction and, and other forces, uh, and then UV degradation. Um, generally, when we, when we do, uh, when we do manufacture components for the marine environment, um, it, 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 it's a fairly small group of materials we're working with. And the engineers have usually selected a type of material for their application, knowing some parameters so whether it's for uh for um for a certain loading characteristic or whether it's for a certain mass characteristic or whatever they're trying to optimize for their design um we end up seeing materials from you know from plastics um uh and anywhere from hdp to like peak plastics to more advanced ultim type plastics um and then we see there's obviously quite a bit of stainless steel used in in the industry uh 316 stainless um uh but that has its own set of challenges with with corrosion and crevice corrosion um so every material has its own its own challenge and drawback um there's titanium that 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 can perform quite well but it's quite expensive and may not be the best choice for prototyping per se um we do a lot of work especially in the in the subsea robotic world with with aluminum components and, and with aquaculture as well with aluminum components so uh, so those ones we we look at um, um, surface coating for them um, and surface finish um, and the surface finish call outs requirements may be a certain tolerance or call out for a for a gasket surface so we know it needs to seal well under pressure, and we know we need to create an O-ring uh, profile that'll perform well uh, under pressure. So, uh, so products may end up um, being manufactured and then being pressure tested. Um, and for uh, environmental exposure and for uh, corrosion, um, we often end up anodizing uh, a lot of aluminum products we make here. So uh, for, uh, especially with, with the subsea robotic work, um, the products will end up typically being uh, type two or, or type three anodized. Um, type two is a, get a bit of technical speak here, but it's kind of fun for me is what we do. Um, type two is a, um, is a thinner, uh, um, decorative type anodizing but that allows you to apply in like a dye or a color um, like our like our products like this is this external product is a is a type two uh, dye product um, and type three is known as as hard anodizing um, that allows us to produce a a uh, bit more of an engineered surface so that is a that is a harder harder um, harder layer a harder layer of growth uh, it's slightly thicker, so our target layers are between one thousandths and two thousandths, or one or two mil, uh, or metric. We're looking at twenty-five to to fifty microns uh, of total layer thickness, um, and that gives really good barrier protection for products that are that are being used in in the marine environment. So, uh, and then we end up for corrosion protection we end up sealing off those those layer that that layer growth that uh, that oxide layer growth on the aluminum um type 3 anodizing can be uh can be dyed like here's a black sample of a black one uh typically comes out more more green uh more of uh, an industrial kind of um uh, uh defense look green um 
but uh, but it has a real purpose. It's a harder layer. Um, it does very well with corrosion protection. Uh, there's some challenges with designing products that are required to fit because of the layer growth. So there is an actual dimensional change in the product. So the engineers and engineering team need to be aware of some of those issues that may come up. Um, but when we're working with prototypes and designs here, we we often work directly with the engineering team on uh, on addressing those issues up front. And that allows us in our manufacturing side to push a tolerance uh, further to one side if we have to allow more room for, for fit of components. Um, often GD, GD and T type um, tolerancing allows us to communicate that a bit better or allows the engineers to communicate that a bit better. But uh, in ASME toler or in uh, ISO tolerancing, um, that's often not the case. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, other, other coatings do well powder coated um, uh, products. Um, and, and those could even be, you know, those can be steels and alloys. Um, they can do quite well. And there's other oxide coatings that are that are available as well for the marine environment. So, um, so you know, it really depends on on what the engineer was was looking to optimize for their design um, in the material selection. And then, you know, we often find ourselves finishing to those to those requirements. Uh, and can also provide some suggestions along the way there too. Well, that sort of brings up an interesting, uh, another point I, I was hoping to ask, and maybe I'll, I'll direct this to back to Wojtek as well, is the the collaboration between the marine scientists, engineers and manufacturers during this process must be really key. And I, I would say early um, early inclusion or engagement of the manufacturers to do these prototypes is probably really important. Wojtek, in your experience, how, how does that collaboration work? Is, is it working or does it need to be improved? Well, usually it works best if you can put together some sort of joint project, I would say, because then that really focuses the effort. <laughs> um, we definitely work very much with the manufacturers as we're uh, developing a design um, so that, uh, you know, we... We know what the options are, what can be built. We're, we're usually trying to optimize a little bit for cost or things like that. Um, as far as with, um, you know, more of the scientists, like we haven't necessarily worked with them to develop specifically a, a prototype, but it's more trying to solve like the overall larger problem. So for, uh, you know, addressing, uh, you know, the hull, hull cleaning, um, you know, there's a there's a technology side that's uh, challenging to developing hull cleaning robots, but what's even maybe a bit more challenging is uh, figuring out like the whole regulatory side, because there's really big gaps in knowledge um, as to you know what's safe to do, what's not safe to do. So, so we've been working with a uh, you know marine biologist for several years now, for example, along the way to. To understand kind of the interaction that you know our machine would have um, with the hull, with the coating, what impact that would have, as well as understanding, you know, as we're we're performing this task of removing the biofouling, um, what could be the impact um, from what we're removing on the local environment, and is it safe to do? So we've been um, you know engaging with the scientists more so in that respect, but. It's in parallel to developing the prototype. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like it's a big team effort that needs to, to come together and a big, as you said, a, a good uh, joint project. So good opportunities for everyone to sort of talk to each other. Um, Ray, I'm gonna, I've am going got a couple more questions. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A section. I'll get them to, to our panellists. Yeah. Um, Ray, what... From your perspective, what, what have been some of the latest innovations in technology in manufacturing? Uh, and I've been lucky enough to visit Rainhouse Manufacturing, so I've seen all your robots and three things going everywhere. What yeah. are some of the, the latest ones that uh, you're aware of? Well, we, we certainly have a lot of tools uh, available to us that we didn't before. Um, you could look at it from the software side. We've got incredibly easy software now for... Uh, simulating our machining uh, for making sure that uh, the design is um, uh, as innovative as it can be. There's generative AI software that can help you with structural uh, designs. 
that are really interesting, uh, shapes that are organic, you know, that you look at, let's say, a leaf uh, and how the stem is attached. And, and that's a beautiful sort of presentation of, of something that could be used in engineering uh, side of things. Um, and the other tools are, and it's a little bit off tangent to, to what you're asking, but I've heard it a couple of times now, and it's collaborating with experts in in fields that are not yours. So I heard it from Colin and from Wojtek. Uh, Chris didn't really talk about it, but I'm sure they do the same thing. You know, we work with uh, software engineering firms and, and mechanical engineering firms. We work with welding uh, companies. We, we don't we got a welding shop right next door. Uh, so what we've done over the last quarter century basically is, is, is gotten this network uh, put together so yeah, there are tools, you know, like better software, better machines, uh, 3D printing is, is uh, cheaper and easier now and it has its place. Uh, but, you know, I would say it's we're getting smarter as a race. We're building on the shoulders of everybody before us. And we're starting to, to get to the point where, you know, people that live in places like Vancouver Island, are, are it's just like when I was in northern BC you know uh, I was in a small little town called Mackenzie and I had to work with my competitors to uh, keep the mills running I was a maintenance superintendent I got to keep this going you know I go over to BCFP I work at Finley Forest and they would we would make arrangements you know how to uh, do that so if you if you render that down over the years of, that I've been doing this anyway it seems like the biggest benefit we have is we've increased knowledge as a race, we have better tools, and we're starting to understand that collaboration really makes sense. Especially like we're, we're all kind of small companies here globally, but if we uh, pool our resources and work together, we can do way, way more. So it's not really the answer to your question, but I think uh, the interesting part is we got lots of tools, we got robots that can do things for us, and that allows us to do higher thinking, like better things with our brains than you know putting a part in a machine and clamping it down, waiting for it to be done, and, and all that stuff. Uh, it's the same with CMS, right? You you chuck a part on there, and it measures everything and tells you what's wrong and what's right. So so those are tools that that do push you forward. But again, I think it's. Uh, it's it's the minds of people that are really really making a difference here. And I think that I mean, thank you because I think it led me into my sort of closing question that I'm going to put to a couple of people. But um, I think the biggest thing for me has been to see what the capability is that we do have. And as you yeah. talked about the smart, the the smarts and and the people that are doing incredible things in this in this region and and in in, in British Columbia. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to. Quickly, and, and Colin, we've probably got about 30 seconds, and I'm going to go to Chris to finish off as well on the same question. In your experience, in your current state, what can BC do to expand our capability and capacity in this sector? Um, I think the biggest thing is just letting new companies know, like, we, we need to put some type of a forum, like places like Coast, uh, like ABCMI, like the Canada Ocean Supercluster, Organizations like that where people who are looking uh, to bring on a new product or to prototype, uh, places like that are going to help companies know that we have the capability here in BC. Like Amongst the four companies that are sitting here, I don't think there's anything that we couldn't build that somebody needed to put in the water. Uh, heck, if, if they needed to put it in space, I think if we put our heads together, we, we would be able to do that. Uh, and sometimes that gets missed. Uh, we're seen as the drawers of water and the hewers of wood, you know, you know, like good resource industries and, you know, like heavy, heavy machining, that, that kind of thing. But there, there is a, there is a high tech capability in manufacturing that we possess in BC and, um, really just getting people to know that that's there. That's, that's the biggest thing. Um, who's there, who can do what capabilities they have and what can they do to help your move your project forward? Perfect. Chris, in 30 seconds from Campbell River, how do we, is that, uh, is that a good direction to get that knowledge out? What, what capability we have? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, you know, both, both Ray said it really well with, with, you know, working in collaboration with, with across uh, 
across fields and different different disciplines and and Colin said it really well uh, describing you know the importance of working with collaboration groups group like groups like coast and these and these ecosystems uh, that can help bring people together I think is really important I also think it's really important to look at kind of the larger scale um, uh, with with also like things like property and resource management make sure we're leave space for manufacturing in cities um, it's really important that we do that and we have space for manufacturing uh, in cities and where, where it's possible to put these facilities and have these jobs um, where we don't just become a you know residential economy um, we, we can really uh, you know have BC on the map as being a manufacturing economy as well too so I think that's that's to me is really important when I see that, especially in a small city. There's very few resources that are given to to, to manufacturing spaces, um, and and I think I think that's 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 another one. So um, yeah, so the groups and collaboration, and then the ecosystems, and then and then the allocating space for for these businesses to 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 set up and and grow. Perfect. Well, we are out of time. We're actually over time, but I could sit here for hours ch chatting to the four of you. Thank you so much for giving up your time. I know you're very busy. I uh, appreciate uh, the contribution. Uh, just quickly to remind people, Ray Braum, President of Rainhouse Manufacturing, Colin Lacey, Market and Business Development for Thai Crop Trailers, Chris Fletcher, Founder, GN G2CNC, and Voitech Clapchurch, Co-Founder for CEO for Offshore and CEO of Offshore Designs. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll see you next time. Uh, please visit our website. This podcast will be listed up on that website. And uh, we look forward to the, your next uh, our next web, uh, web series next month. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you, everybody.